Hello, welcome to this week's Sparta Live webinar. Γεια σα, καλώ ορίσατε στη διαδικτυακή διάλεξη τη σειρά μα Sparta Live. I'm Chrysanthi Gallu, Director of the Center for Spartan and Peloponnesian Studies and Associate Professor of Archaeology in the University of Nottingham. My co host is Dr. Petros Dukas, the mayor of the modern city of Sparti. One of the first things that Mayor Dukas and I discussed when we first met, and that was a couple of summers ago, was the right way to promote an accurate image of Sparta and its legacy to the wider public. We both agreed that one such way is to challenge the misappropriation of Sparta and its image. And so uh, this is how we came up with the idea of the Sparta Live series at the first place. No doubt, the Spartans have fascinated the world with uh, since antiquity, and in our day, discussions of these amazing people, their history and culture are prolific, from classrooms to political speeches and the internet, to name just a few examples. Today's webinar focuses on Sparta and the internet, the ups and downs of public history online, and the experiences of public historians trying to engage in the online discourse of Sparta. And of course, it wasn't very difficult to look for speakers because we couldn't think of more suitable uh, ones than Dr. Owen Rees and Dr. Ruel Kennedy uh, Kate. Uh, so Owen and Ruel, welcome. I should now turn over to my co-host, Mayor Dukas, to introduce properly our speakers. And uh, Ruel, sorry if I killed your surname. Petros, over to you. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Rishanthi, and really congratulations to you and Matt and the whole uh, Nottingham team for what they've done. I mean, uh, it's a tremendous service to history and to Sparta itself. You can see behind me the Greek flag, the flag of the city of Sparta and the Byzantine double eagle flag. So great uh, to be here again and uh, welcome to all our friends who are listening. Um, we have two really great uh, speakers and congratulations again for something for uh, finding them and uh, bringing it, uh, them to our uh, series. Owen is associate uh, lecturer of Asian history at Manchester Metropolitan University. His books include Great Battles of the Classical Greek World, Great Nebel Battles of Ancient Greek World, Military Departures, Homecomings and Death in Classical Athens. Hope Lit Transitions, which is due to be published at the end of 2021. He is also the founder and lead editor of uh, the website badancient.com, a website that fact checks common claims made about the ancient world and exposes prevalent pseudo history in the modern day. Quite, quite interesting. Rowell is departmental lecturer in ancient history at New College, Oxford. Before this, he taught at the Burbeck and Warwick and held a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellowship at Leiden University. He specializes in classical Greek warfare and its modern historiography. He has been spreading the word about ancient history since he was an undergrad, working as a tour guide in National Museum of Antiquities in Leiden. He now haunts various online platforms, platforms to talk about Greek history and war. Owen and uh, Roy, welcome to Sparta Live. And without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for having us and for inviting us both. I don't want to talk for rules uh, on rules behalf, but I know we're both uh, very grateful for the opportunity. Um, this is quite a different talk to the ones you've had recently. This is not about cutting edge research or uh, the like. We are more intrigued, more interested about um, public perception and public interaction with historians on the topic of Sparta. Um, there's no need to validate why this is a topic. Um, Sparta is everywhere. It is absolutely everywhere. It is in the most popular memes floating the internet. It is in uh, various games. You see it called upon for advertising of mixed martial arts gyms, uh, just general weightlifting gyms. We see it um, in sporting events. You've got the Spartan race, big obstacle course. You've got um, of course, the Spartathlon, the great uh, ultra marathon as well. Um, but we're also seeing the more negative side recently where we've seen, you know, its invocation in the storming of the capital. We've seen uh, we've even seen it in the UK um, as a model to uh, defend Brexit 
use Spartan, uh, the Spartan name to defend the ideas of Brexit going on. Um, the reason why I'm kind of reiterating this is because public history, when it comes to the ancient world, is as much about Sparta as it is anything else. So for myself, I'm not actually a Spartan specialist. My area is uh, more generally ancient Greece and the socio-military dynamics. But where Sparta comes in, I'm not a Spartan specialist. However, it's just too popular to ignore. If you want to be a public historian, if you want to do this in the public arena, you have to know something about Sparta and you have to be ready to engage with these topics. So public history is not something we really talk about much in ancient history, um, especially not compared to the more modern histories. Um, the mo most common approach to public history is the one we're most familiar with. You know, it's Mary Beard, Bethany Hughes, Michael Scott, Paul Cartledge, the great Paul Cartledge. You know, it's, it's that popularising of history. It's that grabbing the audience and going, this is interesting, look at it. Um, and that's certainly what got me into ancient history. It's no doubt what got many of us interested in it. Um, Paul Cartledge in particular, you know, I, I read him as a teenager. He's why I do what I do. There is another way of doing public history that we're seeing more and more now, which is um, quite politically engaged. Um, it's a reclamation of history. It's the idea that we're going to take back uh, ancient history that's been done wrong by other people. It could be quite confrontational, but there is a reason for that. And it's, it's a valid approach. Our approach is slightly different. Um, it doesn't work for books. It's less confrontational, but it's very popular online. And that is a question based approach. So we receive questions from people. And we try and create an environment where there is no judgment for those questions. You can ask any question you want and you will not be judged for it at all. Um, and it is simply that you are just asking questions and we or uh, a relevant expert will try and answer them. All right, so uh, if we click to the first slide, you'll see uh, the project I am particularly working on. So I was approached by Ancient World magazine, uh, one of the most popular online ancient history magazines um, in the world at the moment. Um, and they came up to me and suggested a fact checking website that I would lead for them. This was uh, this has become badancient.com. So we're a editorial, small editorial team, um, but we bring in external experts as contributors. So we take questions from the public. You see a couple on your screen now, and we get relevant experts to try and answer them. Um, on the plus side, we get to get asked really interesting questions. Like really interesting questions a historian may not necessarily think of. On the downside, because of the format, these have to be short, these have to be digestible. We can't answer uh, longer questions. Um, needless to say, Sparta is a popular topic. Um, on the next slide, you will see um, the kind of questions we're getting about Sparta. Um, most recently. When we first started this website, this was the most common topic that came up, Sparta. We want to know about Sparta. To contextualise, Athens, we've never received a question about, ever. It was a little unexpected. Um, and interestingly, the top question there about infanticide, this is the most popular question we have on the site. It accounts for almost 25% of all the hits our website gets in a monthly period. These are popular topics people want to know. These, this is not about academic debate. It, it, it's actually quite a simple process. Um, they ask a question. We simply answer with what do the sources say and what does the um, up to date scholarship answer on this. Sometimes this allows us to give a solid answer. This is true. This is false. Sometimes we have to hedge our bets and give more of a vague answer, which is, you know, this is um, misleading or, you know, this is mostly false with some elements of truth in it. And we have a, a rating system to allow us to do that. The one downside to this format, if I can point one out, is we can't handle big questions. So the kind of like the most common question we would receive and we do kind of receive and we have to ignore is was Sparta a warrior society? 
that's too big a question for a thousand words. That's too uh, subjective a topic to work in our format. Rule, we'll talk to you about other formats later where this works a bit better. Um, so that is the, uh, the Bad Ancient project that I work on. Um, what, I, what we wanted to do after we got this site running was, of course, we need people to ask us questions. To ask us questions, the public need to know we exist. So we came up with the idea last year with the with the um, anniversaries that were going well, the official anniversaries that were going around for Thermopylae um, and the like. Um, we actually decided to engage uh, on Twitter to try and um, push our message further out there and get the site um, in people's minds. So on the next slide, you'll see um, one example for working with. You'll notice that I uh, grabbed Rule himself uh, to um, help me out with this one. So the idea here, this is to engage more people. Um, Twitter doesn't really work as a format uh, for history. It doesn't allow nuance. Um, however, it is very good for hitting a lot of people very quickly. Um, and oddly enough, the Bad Ancient Project began as a Twitter idea. It began as a hashtag I created for my students, for my university students, to get them thinking about um, the ancient world in the modern day and in what they see around them. Throw it on the hashtag, we can talk about it in class. Um, needless to say, the Spartan ones always got the most traction. Sparta is always the most popular topic. Um, so as I say, we, I decided uh, to do a series of tweets, what we call a tweet-a-thon um, on Thermopylae and on Sparta. And I grabbed Rule specifically for his uh, his experience on this online as well. So we wrote a few posts on Thermopylae itself and the myths surrounding that battle. Uh, we covered Artemisium, the naval battle, and similar myths that surround that. And then we hit Persian culture, misconceptions of Persian culture, misconceptions of Spartan culture. That was it. Um, whilst we did get a lot of positive feedback and, you know, we're, that should never be understated. We got a lot of pushback. Uh, we got a lot of aggressive criticism. Um, and I, I've been thinking about this for a while, especially to do with the role of the historian. And I wonder part of this might well be because on something like Twitter, we haven't been asked for this information. We have given it to the world. And this appears on everyone's timelines uh, by accident almost. You know, there are algorithms involved, but I can't control what appears on other people's timelines. So you wonder how much of this is the sense that we are imposing ourselves on the thoughts and opinions of other people. But there was um, backlash, uh, what we might call knee-jerk nationalism. Um, a lot of Greek or Greek identifying uh, nationalists uh, were very against the revisionism, shall we say, um, as they like to describe this, um, almost the rewriting of history. There was actually the flip side of that as well. We had the nationalist uh, groups from places like Iran and Iraq who associated more clearly with the Persian element of the story um, and saying that they completely agreed and this is right. Um, and of course, that's just the two sides of the of a knee jerk reaction, which is we want history to say what we want it to say. Um, we do get critiques. This is not always a pleasant environment. We do get um, harsh critiques. Um, I'm not sure about rule, but I've had my PhD challenged quite a few times. Uh, it's not real. I've had a fake one. Um, I don't know how you get a fake one. Actually, I, I do. I used to work in education for it, but it's not an easy thing to achieve. Um, I know Rule in particular has had his uh, lack of military experience questioned. Uh, this is often thrown at military historians. I've never had that, but I think that might just be the haircut. Um, or my favourite is we have been told that we must be paid by the Turkish government. We have not been paid by the Turkish government, but if anyone wants to fund me, I would appreciate that. <laughs> Um, but, you know, joking aside, we do get these kind of critiques. Some of them are very aggressive, some of them are very rude. Others are um, more engaged with the topic and we appreciate that element of it. So I want to kind of finish my area before I push on to rule uh, to kind of give you an idea of how we rule and I, but also my bad ancient team deal with abuse online. That's something a lot of us have to deal with. Um, not just in history and everything we do. So we have a couple of rules that we abide by. 
The first one on Twitter, I never enter Twitter alone. It's like a dark room. I never enter it alone. It's a scary place to be. Um, so when we did, the, when I came up with the tweetathon, I immediately found someone who I could engage with. So immediately, any issues that were coming, both Rule and I were facing them together, and anyone else who might well be involved as well. Um, and just to give you an idea how deep that went, Rule and I were in constant personal communication through it to help each other out. Um, and to deal with what was going on, negative and positive, let them know something good was happening as well. Within Bad Ancient, um, we do deal with some very volatile topics. We also deal with some very controversial topics, things that we may not necessarily think are controversial um, at first glance. So at Bad Ancient, we have a policy where we offer our writers the opportunity to have anonymity. So it's just a bad ancient post that goes up. Your name doesn't have to be on it. Um, and we do this so that if there is any abuse, it comes to the website, it comes to the team rather than the individual. And that is unfortunately a, uh, a real reality, a proper reality to engaging with some of these topics. And unfortunately, Sparta does attract a lot of this in particular. But that is quite enough of the negative of all of this. I'm now going to pass you over to my colleague friend Rule, who will take you through some of the other platforms where we uh, engage in similar discourse. Thanks very much Owen and thanks as well for to Kisanti and uh, to Mayor Dugas for having us. Um, I am going to probably cover a fair amount of things that Owen has mentioned already but that does have value in itself as well just to sort of reconfirm that we are having similar experiences across different platforms and different circumstances. Um, one of the things that I'm immediately going to repeat, but everybody, every scholar in the room will already be aware of this, um, is that I'm also not an expert on Sparta. Everything that I've ever published on Sparta comes out of my research on classical Greek warfare and is related to the peculiar Spartan military system. I'm not necessarily a specialist on the Spartan field. And it is under the, or in the guise of an expert on classical warfare, um, that I joined this online community about five years ago called Ask Historians. And I've given you the sort of front page of that website as it looks today uh, on the next slide. Um, this is what Ask Historians looks like. Um, so this is a subreddit, which is to say that it is one of the communities upon the website called reddit.com, which is a community aggregator. That is to say, people come to the website they find within that website what kind of communities interest them based on what topics and, and locations and uh, whatever it is that they find interesting, they join those sub communities. Um, there is a whole range of different subreddits specifically on history. Um, within that group, we are an ask subreddit, which is a specific subgroup specifically defined by this really quite sim uh, simple format that every submission to this community uh, has to be a question about the subject. So people post questions to us and then any user that feels that they have the expertise to be able to give a good answer to this question um, is allowed to then share that with the community and everybody can see it for themselves. And then the way that Reddit works as a website is that it rewards people for making posts that are considered good. People can upvote uh, as in give their approval or their thumbs up to the things that they like and give thumbs down to the things that they don't like. Um, as a result of that, quite a lot of it is um, popularity context, uh, contests. And if you want to um, maintain any level of quality control, you have to intervene quite strongly. You have to make sure that it isn't, you know, the funny joke that everybody likes that ends up at the top, but actually the person who's taken the time to give an in-depth answer. And so Ask Historians is quite notorious across the website of Reddit um, for its very heavy handed moderation we intervene very, very heavily because we discovered very early on um, since this place was founded in 2011 that the only way to make sure that you provide a space, you curate a space for high quality, in-depth answers for these kinds of questions is effectively to remove anything that isn't a high, high quality, in-depth answer. So basically we encourage people to write really long form, detailed answers not just by encouraging them to do that and by cultivating a community that, that, that rewards that, 
but also by removing anything that falls short of that, vetting all the answers and showing, uh, fi uh, filtering out the ones that fall short. And as a result of that, we are really well known to be a place where you can get like really quality engagement with experts on historical topics. And some people really go wild with the amount of expertise that they're willing to lay at the feet of the people who come to us with questions. I mean, there is a limit to the size of a post on Reddit. It's 10,000 characters, so say about two to 3,000 words. But some people just string together a really long series of posts. I mean, the longest that I've written is four. Um, but some people go up to 10, 12, 17 posts in a row, which means that you've basically written a third of a book um, in answer to somebody's question. Some people really, really go into it. And that is the reputation that we have. So very strict moderation on the one, on the one hand, um, very high quality answers on the other. And as a result of cultivating that for a number of years, we are now a really large household subreddit on this website. We have, as you can see on the screenshot, I think somewhere, I don't know, you can't see it on this one. Um, we have about 1.3 million subscribers and we receive about 150 to 200 questions every day. Now, of course, those questions are about any subject. Um, so they, they can be about any part of history, but obviously ancient history is a very large part of that. And the really interesting, fascinating, and for me, the really engaging thing about this platform is that the questions are entirely user generated. So as Owen said, we are not telling you this is what I want to talk about. Like I want to, I know about Greek warfare and so I'm going to tell you about Greek warfare. Instead, people come to us and ask us what they want to know. And if we think we have the answer to those questions, um, we then you'll write that answer. Otherwise, we wait for someone else to do so. And of course, once people receive an answer, sometimes they receive several answers from different people, you know, highlighting different aspects of a question or taking different perspectives on it. Um, they're also able to ask follow up questions. Other people can butt in and say, could you say more about this? Could you tell me what your sources are? These kind of things, which makes this not knowledge transfer. This is not like doing a podcast or a public lecture. Um, this is public engagement. This is actually meeting people where they are and responding directly to what they want from you as an expert. So it is a unique environment in which people have direct access to people who really can tell them something they don't know and something they are looking to find out. Um, the problem with that system, unfortunately, there is a catch, um, is that like every website, Reddit has a demographic. Um, there is a predominance of a certain kind of person on this website, specifically, um, there is a very serious predominance of young white American men on this website. And obviously that is a demographic like any other demographic that comes with a specific subset of pre-existing knowledge and interests. And obviously that is not universal, but it creates a certain sort of focus, a certain um, emphasis on particular parts of history. In particular, there is just going to be much more on European and American history than there is on African, Latin American or Asian history. And there's going to be much more on a couple of specific aspects of history, including military and political history, than there is on the huge range of things that people nowadays study in the university. And when it comes to ancient history, exactly as Owen said, um, this means that there is a very heavy preponderance of questions specifically on Sparta. So ancient history to a large share of this demographic consists essentially of Sparta and Rome. Um, not ancient Greece and Rome, Sparta and Rome. So when I count up the questions that I receive, I mean, you get a lot of questions about Athenian democracy um, very narrowly, but a vast amount of these questions really are about Sparta and about Sparta's involvement in the Persian Wars. And so I like to joke that I joined this forum, I joined this community to talk about Greek warfare, but actually all I do is answer questions about Sparta. And um, I mean, some of the kind of questions that I've had and that I've answered over the years, I've gathered for you on the next slide. And this is really um, quite a narrow selection of the kinds of things that you get. But I do want to stress that like the kind of things that you get are not perhaps as narrow as you might expect. So we're not just getting questions about warfare and we're not just getting questions about Thermopylae. We're actually getting a lot of questions that have to deal much more with the idea of Sparta as a society. Um, we're, so we're getting questions about, you know, the Spartan kingship, about this idea of Spartan infanticide, which uh, Owen also mentioned is a very popular subject, um, but also about, you know, Spartan laconic speech, about uh, Spartan demography. I've had to answer several questions in considerable depth about this decline of Spartan numbers, this oligantropia. 
Um, the Spartan body is, a, is an aspect of enduring obsession. People really want to know, did they really look like they do in the movie? Um, you know, did they have those muscles? And how do I get them? Uh, people really ask us that, you know, is there a secret to the way the Spartans worked out? Um, and the final question that I've listed here, which I'll come back to, uh, this idea of um, the Spartans as an exalted warrior culture, as more efficient fighters than anyone else in antiquity and possibly anyone else in history. Now, the kind of thing that I want to say about this list, and there is, there are many, obviously many dozens more that I've answered and many dozens more that occur, you know, in every, any average month, um, questions about Sparta are constantly trickling in. But there are a couple of themes that we can highlight here. Firstly, as I said, they're very broad. Um, secondly, they're often visibly inspired by popular histories. People come to us because they've seen 300, because they've read Gates of Fire. Often you get direct questions that are directly related to that. Um, they build on the assumptions that they get from reading about Sparta that way. Um, so they will ask us things that are based on their understanding of this society as it is fed to them by these pop history sources. But also, and this is kind of really interesting when you consider these questions, um, there is a very strong desire to interrogate the received version, interrogate myths and tall tales. People come to us not to say, oh, this is cool, tell me more about it. People come to us and say, is that really true? Did they really do these things that we hear about which sound outlandish, which sound hard to understand, like infanticide or like the way they treated children, the way they treated women, the way they treated helots? People come to us and say, how does that actually work? Do, what, what is the evidence of that? So people are really quite capable of phrasing these questions in a critical way and interrogating what they found. That is what they come to me for. That is what they come to ask historians to do. And so the final question, just to come back to that, is exactly that kind of question, which for Owen's Bad Ancient Project might be too big, but for me is basically, I spent a Sunday afternoon writing about three or 4,000 words on this question. Um, is the military worship of the Spartans justified? Um, but just to say, basically, like, I, you know, people can see this, they, they've seen 300, they've read about the Spartans, they think, is this really, were they really that good? Were they really that powerful, that effective, that well-trained and disciplined, etc.? And obviously the answer to that is not simple. And I had to spend some time trying to piece apart both the underlying aspects that we know of, the superiority of certain aspects of the Spartan military system for hoplite fighting, but also to outline how the Spartans tried to build on that system and try to make a sort of propaganda narrative about themselves in order to intimidate their enemies and retain their power in Greece. So you have quite a complex story of different layers of history working together, which I tried to explain to the best of my ability in a short time. But this thread really blew up, as we say. This became really big. This um, made it into the sort of the aggregate uh, listing of the website, which threads very occasionally do. So questions that get posted to us um, become so popular that they end up on the feeds of anybody visiting the website because it is considered to be prime content for that day. So people start talking about it and people start coming in from other communities, people who might not have any interest in ancient history or history. Um, they come in because they read the title and say, that's an interesting question. I would like to know. And they come to us and they read this post that I wrote. And this went all over the website. And this is by far the most widely shared post that I've ever written on this website. It keeps getting shared all around the place. And every few weeks, somebody from outside our community links to it and says, look, you should read this. If you want to know about Sparta, you should read this. You should really bear this in mind because this is going to tell you something you don't know. It goes absolutely all over this website, but it has also made it outside. And I can really tell over the years, it's become really apparent that this has changed the way that not just Ask Historians, but Reddit in general talks about Sparta. People can't just get away with telling you what Plutarch says. They now have this thing to refer to and they now no longer believe that it is um, you know, that it is the best way to think about it, to look at 300 and to look at this kind of myth making and think that it, that is all there is to know about it. Unfortunately, it's irrecoverable how many people actually saw that thread, but the next slide I've given you um, some of the things that follow directly from that answer. One of those is that a, a YouTuber um, going by the name of Invicta, uh, Julian Blarell, reached out to me and said, I would like to use this script. Can you advise me on turning this into a video? 
we turned it into a 20 minute video and that has now passed 2 million views on YouTube. And following up on that, we did various other things that relate to this. So I posted it on Ancient World Magazine. It's one of their um, articles now, which you see at the bottom. But we also did with Invicta a live stream Q&A about this, where people could just barge in on YouTube, ask me any questions, um, receive an answer. This went on for two and a half hours. People kept pouring in with more and more questions. And building up on this, um, I ended up having sort of access points to various other communities which had these kinds of questions, which realized that there is a market for information about Sparta that is new and different and interesting. So on the next slide, I've given you some of the uh, examples of the things that I've done since. So further videos with Invicta, um, exploring different aspects of uh, Spartan history in different ways, talking about their military history, criticizing modern pop culture, but also using modern pop culture like the game Assassin's Creed Odyssey to try and explore and comment and critique on um, the normal everyday life of the Spartans, um, on the way that their, their towns looked and the, with the fabric of their society. In addition, I've done various podcasts. I've done, uh, you know, History Hack, I've done the Ask Historians podcast. And most recently, um, before the whole pandemic uh, threw a spanner in the works, I was actually um, in Munich in the office of the um, pop science channel Kurzgesagt um, to work with them on a new uh, a series of videos about history, um, which specifically took the angle of let's look at Sparta, let's look at the Persian Wars differently. Let's tell that story the way that I told it on Reddit. Um, and all of these opportunities come directly from my association with Ask Historians on Reddit. People don't come to me by email. They don't come to me on social media. They write to me on Reddit. They write personal messages to me to ask, hey, I know that this is what you do here. Can you come and help me do it elsewhere? Um, so these kind of things, these kind of opportunities keep sort of popping up because I've done this now for some time and you, you keep getting more and more people who are interested in taking some form of that and making it work for them and trying to find, trying to explore this to greater depth. Um, and one of the things that you can clearly see from the kind of titles that you see on the screen here is that we are maintaining this theme, this idea of debunking, this idea of deflating myths or taking away the kind of tall tales that people have been told about Sparta. And that is what a lot of what feeds a lot of this enduring interest. It is not necessarily a fascination with what those myths are um, and how they portray the society, but rather what is behind it. People want the story behind the story. They need someone who can tell them in detail. What is the source base? What are the debates about this? And for me, this has resulted in me. I, I mean, I now have a whole shelf of books on Sparta directly behind me, um, which, as I said, I'm not an expert on this, but it, <coughs> it repays itself because I get so many questions on all aspects of Spartan society that I'm answering sort of on a weekly basis. Um, the difference when you're going outside of an environment like Ask Historians is that there is no, um, no sense of a default authority. On Ask Historians, people respect the knowledge. People come there because they want that answer. When you provide it to them, that is something that they're grateful to receive. I very rarely receive any pushback on what I write on Ask Historians. Very often, there is an overwhelming sense of gratitude. Outside of Ask Historians, this is very different. People don't necessarily respect your authority. People don't necessarily want to hear what you have to say. And people very often, as Owen already pointed out, are willing to go very, attack you on a very personal level if they don't like what you wanted to present to them. They will either question your credentials, question your personality, question your expertise, or simply say, well, I've read this and that is exactly as valuable to me and my understanding as all of the scholarly expertise that you've gathered over the years. There is really no way to win that argument. There's really no way to constructively engage with this. People either want to hear what you have to say or they don't. And this is one reason why I find Ask Historians incredibly rewarding, whereas I haven't, for instance, tried to you know, launch my own YouTube series or anything like that, because it is a very different kind of platform where a lot of the feedback that you get is a lot more critical and it's a lot harder to fight your way in. And another reason for that is actually the problem that you're also competing with a lot of other people who are doing very similar things with the purpose of creating effectively infotainment. And I'm not trying to say that I could do it better than all of these people. I mean, these people are especially very good at creating videos. I can't make the kind of videos that Invicta makes. The best I can do is supply knowledge about the ancient world, scholarship about the ancient world. 
but I can't make videos like they do. And so you're competing against people who, for the casual browser of YouTube or the casual visitor or listener to podcasts, are exactly identical. There is no way for them to distinguish between what I've written for Invicta and what somebody else uh, has written on the basis of a couple of books they read or some Wikipedia searches and slapped together in a video. And you can't, again, you can't win that engagement. There is no way in which you can convince them to turn away from this series that they've been watching for years and only to look at you instead. And there is no value necessarily in doing that um, because people will watch what they watch and they don't necessarily watch it in order to be educated by somebody who has tried his best to be up to date on all the scholarship. That may not be what they're looking for. And so to some extent, competing with these people on their turf is always very difficult and something that you have to bear in mind that you are doing and you are constantly losing that fight and you will and there's no there's nothing else that you can do about that. Um, and so with that kind of context in mind, like the kind of thing that we wanted to leave you with is kind of the, uh, the understanding that we have over doing this for several years of how to try and engage with this kind of environment and how to try and do it constructively. And there are many lessons from doing this a lot and from trying to go over this again and again. Um, but the main, the key points that we've decided are sort of the, the, the main ways in which you can do this in a way that, that both keeps yourself sane and means that you come across in a positive way. Um, firstly, is a responsibility to be up to date because you have effectively one chance to reach people and they're not going to interrogate it. They're not going to necessarily look into the details very much. Make sure that you know your scholarship because if they only watch one video, it's got to be one that represents what we now believe to be the cutting edge, to be the best understanding we have of ancient history. Secondly, as Owen already said, don't judge the questions. People come to you with this information. That is your prize. That is the gold mine. People want to listen to you. Don't tell them off. Don't scare them off, um, but instead engage them where they are and build on that. Turn it into the question you wanted to answer if you must. We do that a lot on Ask Historians, um, but never question what they actually ask you, what they want to know. Um, and finally, and this is, I think, very, very crucial, and it's the last thing I'll say, um, is to not dumb it down in terms of what scholarship is and what it does. People are really willing to consider difficult questions of sources and scholarship. People are willing to, under to accept that we don't know everything. And so this is something that we can tell them. We can accept the limitations of the expertise that we have and of the evidence that we can provide. We can say we don't know, we cannot answer every question. And it is important for them to, for wider audiences to understand that this is how academia works sometimes, what we don't always know, how to answer the things that we might really badly want to find out. And on that sort of footing, you can talk to people in an honest way and hopefully reach them. Great. Uh, thank you, Owen and Rul, for presenting so clearly the complex and powerful relationship between the internet and public history and using Sparta as a case study. Uh, we have a lot of questions for you on uh, the chat, uh, but I would like to take the uh, privilege of host and uh, ask a question about um, slavery. Do you get questions about halots and slavery? And I have also in mind the Black Lives uh, uh, Matter movement. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? From my personal perspective, um, it is not something that comes up uh, for the formats we have. Mm -hmm. um, not really sure I can read too much into why. Um, I have found there is a real sense of people wanting heritage to be different um, and perhaps not um, collating it with other forms of slavery throughout history. Um, but as a particular topic, um, no, whenever the heritage comes up in my area, it's more often to do with the Spartans dealing with them mm -hmm. than it is the helots themselves. I don't know if Rule has a different experience. No, that's exactly it. I mean, people's understanding of Sparta is very heavily biased towards the male Spartiate citizens. And so there is a limited awareness of helots and perioiko in other groups. Um, and there is an also a limited interest in them. But I don't think people are shy about it. I mean, people aren't trying to ignore it or trying to pretend it doesn't exist. In most cases, it's just that they don't really know. And especially with Ask Historians, a big, big problem that we face is when people don't know about the subject, they also don't know how to ask questions about it. 
Um, but we do get them. We do get questions about helots every now and then. Thank you. Uh, Petros? There, there is an Italian saying uh, that says, uh, sen non è vero e ben provato, which means if it, even if it's not true, it's still cool. And I'm sure with uh, the history of Sparta, there is a lot of that, like in the film 300 uh, of Hollywood. It wasn't meant to be a historical documentary. It was meant to excite uh, the younger people into something that was fascinating. We get complaints about historical facts and sometimes I tell them, OK, you know, be cool about it. It's, uh, you know, people can take liberty sometimes with history to make it the way they think is more exciting. Uh, so many thanks to Owen and Roll. And Roll, uh, this Spartan Royal Guard and uh, Hoplit Warfare, where are they accessible for the common folk? Uh, is are you going to make a series that you may present uh, in uh, Netflix or something? Or is it just one off things? Or what do you have in mind? Unfortunately, these are these are just one offs. They, they, they are freely available on YouTube uh, under the channel name Invicta. Um, but I am, like I said, I, I'm working with this channel Kurzgesagt, which is uh, hopefully, hopefully I'm soon setting up a new series specifically on Greek history um, as a pilot to their larger plan to have a second channel on history uh, next to their one currently mostly about pop science. Um, so hopefully soon, you know, watch this space. <laughs> Thank you. And for example, we had discussed with Chrysanthi. Chrysanthi, I hope I'm not taking too much uh, time here. Uh, a history of Helen of Troy, which is really Helen of Sparta. But during the period she was in Sparta, what happened in the palace of Menelaus? And she fell in love with the prince of Troy, who was a guest of her husband. Something happened there and the, under the radar of Menelaus and they sneaked into Troy. So some of the aspects of Spartan history may have this kind of interest, you know, more so rather than just the pure historical interest. What were the facts of history? Now, what were the humans uh, doing at that time that are not dissimilar what, to what humans are doing today beyond the war history and the major glory and what have you? And this may be an interesting angle for you and Owen to have a look at. Since you are involved in the Internet, there may be other aspects that are uh, not in terms of uh, historical accuracy, but they're socially very, very interesting, especially for the young uh, population. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, a lot of my work isn't so much uh, knowledge exchange and academic work to the public as much as it is popularizing. Now, I'm a firm believer, as Rules kind of highlighted, that actually there's a lot more critical engagement in the public sphere than they're given credit for. Um, so I'm all for that. But on the same token, a sexy story is a sexy story um, and you use it wherever you can get it. Um, what interests me and one of the reasons I like the Q&A approach um, is to allow us to break away from the narratives that especially book publishers think the public want. So, for instance, one of my favourite stories from uh, the Spartans, it is Plutarch, unfortunately, but it's his, it's his uh, life of Agesilaos. And of all the stories about Agesilaos and, you know, Agesilaos II, you know, the great king of Sparta, um, is an amazing story of his life. Um, and it just such an engaging story. One of my favourite bits in it is there's a lovely little scene where he's playing with his children. Yes, yes, yes. Interrupted by uh, a Spartan soldier and warrior of some sort uh, who, who, and he just turns to him and goes, don't judge me until you've had one of your own. And it's just a right. lovely human moment. Um, but it's a story you don't really get to tell much. Um, and it, it is my favourite, and it does tie in. Xenophon himself does describe Agesilaos as a family man. Now, academic paper, you're not going to get much out of that information. But in the public sphere, you're absolutely right. People want to hear those kind of stories. They want that human aspect. Um, but for us and for what we're doing, we still need to stay the kind of the right side of non-fiction, if that makes sense. Um, but no, I absolutely agree. There's so many more interesting stories. We're trying actually to find producers 
that could actually take advantage of uh, such stories uh, and uh, see if they can turn them into something much more popular. I'm interested to just generate even more interest for the city of Sparta, so I have other things in mind. But even that, even if it's not 100% accurate and it talks about Sparta, it's good enough for us. And that's the Menelaos and Helen of Troy story is the second story of infidelity. Because when the Athenian general uh, Alcibiades was exiled from Athens and came to Sparta, there were rumors that he had a kid with one of the queens of Sparta, the wife of the king, who didn't have queens, but uh, the wife of the king. So there is a lot of human stories beyond the um, war glory. And this is what we're trying to take advantage. And I thank you for making that happen uh, in a different way via the uh, social media. Shall I uh, invite Matt Thompson, uh, uh, the secretary of the center, uh, who's always here to help us to handle the Q&A session? Because I can see we have around 12 questions, which is amazing. Yes, thank you, Chrysanthi, and thank you. It's been absolutely brilliant talks today. Uh, loads of questions coming in. Keep them coming. I will do my best to ask as many as I can. Um, but the first one up here, uh, in the age of widespread misinformation and misappropriation of history, how important uh, do you think it is for academics to disseminate their knowledge and research uh, on online, online and on public platforms? Uh, so should we come to Owen first on that? Yeah, so first of all, very. <laughs> Let's keep it simple. Uh, it is very important. However, like I always say with these things, um, especially talk to older colleagues who obviously are being put under pressure for a more public um, persona. And it, if, if you aren't yourself, it will not work. If you do not commit to it, it will not work. So basically, if you are doing it because you feel you should, it most likely will not work. Um, and it is kind of, it's, it's a harsh reality, but it is the reality. Um, the other way of going around it, of course, if perhaps you are not someone who can put up with listening to your own voice, you know, whilst you're editing podcasts, or you cannot put up with watching your face on YouTube like Wool can. Uh, if you cannot, <laughs> if you can, if you, you know, we, we are all very different. If you cannot do that, there are still outlets. Notice Rules had it, I've had it, I know other academics have had it, where you've been approached to write a script. Well, actually, a lot more academics can write scripts than perhaps they give credit for because um, you immediately know what's interesting. You immediately know what you can grab um, as a story because, you, you know, you, you've just read more around it. Um, so uh, there are outlets for you. You know, if Twitter is not your thing, if you are too old for TikTok like I am, if you are, you know, you just Facebook is just a ridiculous construct. Um, you do not have to just do that. There are other forms uh, you can be actually quite behind the scenes and it's your research that is informing the political uh, political the public discourse that's the bit that matters not the historian at the front of it it's the fact that the information is getting out there and if you can find a secure outlet for that i i advise every academic to grab it wonderful uh Ron, would you like to add anything there uh, no, I mean, it, it really is that it's it's uh, we, are, we obviously believe that we should do that. But uh, to me, it's always like, don't you want to? I mean, <laughs> I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> I mean, this is part of the reason why I do it is because I come at it from this kind of perspective myself. I mean, I, I started out watching movies and playing games and thinking what actually is behind these things. And so I, I feel like that is very, not just easy to do, it's almost paying it forward and hoping that one of the people that is watching this is somebody like me who then becomes enthusiastic and wants to learn more and, you know, keeping keeps it going that way. I I can't imagine, you know, doing this kind of thing for a living and trying to 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 further the further our understanding of the ancient world and only talking about it to other academics. I, I, I want to talk to anyone who will listen. <laughs> And I feel like that's, I hope that other people in this in this profession have that same drive, have that same desire to uh, to help other people understand why this is interesting, why why it's cool, why it keeps us so engaged. 
Brilliant, thank you. Uh, just to pick up, I, I think I heard you mention uh, films and games in there. Uh, we've had a question. Do you feel that the presentation of history in video games like Assassin's Creed provides a net loss or a net benefit to the study of the past? Uh, should we go back to you on that rule? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I think it's hard to quantify. It's um, the thing about the the Assassin's Creed games in particular, since the uh, the one that's set in Ptolemaic Egypt, uh, I forgot the name, Origins, they, uh, they've had this exploration mode, which is specifically like strip away the gameplay and just let people wander around in this incredibly detailed, incredibly fully realized version of the setting that they've chosen. And they do I mean, an astounding amount of homework on that, like on the textures, on the patterns and the art styles and the clothing. Um, you know, there is a lot there that I think is the most fully um, realized virtual version of the ancient world that's ever been created. And of course, they get a lot of things wrong, but you can't you can't say that you can't throw that baby out with any bathwater, which is wildly irresponsible not to use that in some way. And of course, they perpetuate myths. Of course, they have, you know, because of the movie 300, their Spartans do things like shout a lot and kick people into wells. But at the same time, like there is so much that you can latch on to. So that video that I did where we just walk around the setting that they built of ancient Sparta. Obviously, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, not, it looks nothing like ancient Sparta, but there is so much that you can talk about, that you can hang up on that framework. Um, and there's nothing else like it, no, no access point that makes it so easy and so attractive to, to visualize the ancient world. Uh, brilliant. Uh, Owen, would you, would you like to weigh in on this one? Well, uh, I think Will's hit the nail on the head there. The only other thing I'd add, I mean, computer games is obviously uh, probably a bigger medium now, for especially in the classroom, it's what I hear most yeah, as a reference point. Um, however, and this goes back to the point that both Raul and I have made about not judging. So don't judge me. Um, but 300 was hugely influential to me as a teenager. Hugely influential. I've now I've given talks recently to like Lancaster University students and things like that, telling you everything that's wrong with that film. Everything is wrong with the Spartan portrayal of, that, of uh, the film, of the battle, of the Persians, everything. Well, I still love that film. Um, and not because it's a good film. I, don't think. <laughs> I think it's because it has that, uh, that, um, that memory that this inspired that interest. Um, and I, I think it is it does it a great disservice for uh, historians to spend all their time saying this is ridiculous um, and anyone who believes it is a fool. Um, I don't think that's the right way to go. I think it's disingenuous and I think we have to be kind of honest. You know, maybe not everyone, of course, but for me, that's what got me into it. So, you know, keep making them, but maybe hire more historical advisors uh, <laughs> to help along. OK, um, another question here in regards to the, the questions uh, about Sparta that we get on Reddit and also on uh, Bad Ancient. Uh, do you get many questions about the role of Spartan women? So I don't know who wants to go first there. Owen's nodding. Uh, yeah, Spartan women is a massive, massive interest. Um, we, we, this is also where we got, we get a lot of engagement from non-conventional audiences, for want of a better term. So we do stereotype, it's hard not to stereotype certain groups of people that you engage with. Rule was very honest about um, Ask Historians and the kind of demographic he deals with. But sometimes it's quite unpredictable who picks up uh, Spartan history and runs with it. Um, so recently I've read something on a lot of mothering or mother uh, blogs and forums talking about Spartan women and how they raise their children. Um, so, you know, it's not just history buffs, it's not just people who like Spartan history or ancient history. It is really quite eclectic who picks these things up. Spartan women, yes, absolutely. Um, it's, I always find it comes one of two ways. It's either about how they're superior to all other women or that they are a feminist utopian model. Both of which needs talking about. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's most of my experience at least. Yeah, it's a minority of questions, but we you do get them. And I think when I, when I say about Ask Historians that it is a minority of questions, it is simply because for the same demographic reasons and for the, the reason that everybody 
when they start to think about history, they primarily think about people that they can, to some extent, relate to and feel similar to, um, which is just a natural human behavior. It means that we rarely get questions about women anyway. Women's experiences are a minority of the interest of the demographic, unfortunately. And we do what we can as moderators of this community to try and fix that by really encouraging people to think differently. And in my case, deliberately reading questions that aren't specific enough. You know, if somebody asks me about Spartans, I'm going to be like, oh, you mean Spartan women, right? Um, because I want, to, I want them to learn something more than what they think they want to know about. Because, you know, nine times out of 10, they're very happy to learn it. Um, it's just that they hadn't thought of the question. Um, but you do occasionally get them. You do occasionally get them uh, whether they have a genuine interest, but you unfortunately also occasionally get them where they are inspired by things that they so badly summarize Aristotle that they've read somewhere and they got the impression that actually women are the fault of everything that's bad with Sparta. And then you have to start to sort of, you know, <laughs> roll that back and say, look, um, ancient Greece, all these context, all this context, etc. Um, but in most cases, I think people do have a genuine interest in people from the past. And that's why I highlighted the range of questions that we get about Sparta. And that includes Spartan women, absolutely. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um... So uh, a topic that is is in the news elsewhere at the moment. Do you think uh, the online platforms should be held more accountable for the quality and the thoroughness of the content and the information that they make available? Uh, I'm slightly sorry for that one. <laughs> uh, should, we go, should we go to you first, Rule? Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is how we run as historians, right? We, we moderated very deliberately, very, very heavy handed moderation style because we want to make sure that this is not just uh, an environment for high quality replies, um, but an inclusive one. So we, we absolutely immediately remove anything that gives a sense of bigotry or margin marginalization um, that deliberately presents things in a bad light, we, uh, that, that perpetuates myths that marginalize minorities or women. Um, all these kinds of things we respond very strongly to in order to create a space where everybody can enjoy uh, learning about history and, and, and feels that it is safe to ask their questions and feels that they can trust the answers. Um, so that is that is a continuous work and doing that has created an environment that has, you know, thankfully a very high reputation. It has worked really well for us. Um, but I think in a lot of other platforms, it's it's impossible to try and enforce that. I mean, you can't go through every single thing that gets uploaded to YouTube and check it for factual accuracy. Um, let alone the comments that flow in. I mean, uh, how many hours are, are uploaded? How many hours of footage are uploaded to YouTube per hour? It, it, it would be an unmanageable uh, thing to try and control that. And similarly, other other platforms, so much of it is controlled, uh, is uncontrollable rather. It is is completely impossible to check. And so I would say it really depends on the platform, but that should determine for us as as critical readers, essentially, as as people who want to want to learn about this. Um, it should try and guide us towards the more trusted forms of media. And there should be some kind of level to which these things are not created equal in our understanding. We should believe that there are where, places where we can get more trustworthy information versus places where we're just not sure about the about the accuracy of it and about the amount of work that's gone into it. Yeah, uh, sort of adding on to rules that I think to do with history in particular on these sort of formats, especially things like Twitter, Facebook, you know, all these kind of social media formats, you got to, that's not what they were made for. I mean, they're not made to disseminate historical information. They're not made to disseminate these things. It's what they've sort of become. It's the equivalent of trying to moderate what's being said in a pub. Um, ultimately, if you believe what you hear, the, the drunk guy at the bar said, that's not a reputable place to get information. So I think this is more of an educational issue than it is a uh, social media issue. Um, but they're saying that you start to see it more on things like Twitter, where people are asked for evidence. So it's like, well, what's the article? Give us a link. Uh, what's the, you know, I've read Herodotus. You didn't mention Herodotus. Um, things like that, um, which on the one hand can be quite grating as a historian. But have you heard of Herodotus? Like, yeah, he's, he's come up. Um, <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, it at least shows that there is a sense of, well, there is evidence and you haven't mentioned it. Um, so I suppose that, that, that should be seen as a positive um, 
but uh, in terms of you know the wider stuff, especially what's been going on with um, news in Australia and the like, I mean, I can't comment on things like that. But when it comes to history itself, yeah, social media for me is not a platform to educate; it's a platform to advertise. Um, so we use the we use the Twitterthon, we use um, Twitter links and things like that specifically to direct you somewhere else, and then we direct you to. You know, I've linked to the Ask Historian stuff, I've linked to the Bad Ancient, all the other projects going on. You know, the Pharos website over in the US, and you know, all these amazing projects going on with good work going on. Um, if you're trying to say the same thing on Twitter, it will not work. Excellent, thank you. Um, uh, we have a, a question here from uh, a young woman who uh, says that men uh, often fail to take her uh, seriously intellectually, which is disappointing. But she asks, do you think uh, there's a gap in public history on the Internet for women? Specifically, um, does anyone want to come in first on that one? Oh, uh, wait for me to go live. There we go. Uh, first of all, positionality. Uh, I am male. So everything I'm about to say must always come with that caveat. Um, I would love to go, yes, absolutely, get involved. We we do need more female voices in this. Um, there are actually quite a lot of good, strong, um, authoritative female voices in ancient history. Um, out of all the areas of history, we are quite blessed with that. You know, our sort of one of our biggest names has to be Mary, Mary Beard. You know, we've got the Bethany Hughes of the world as well. We do have um, good female public historians but there needs to be more absolutely needs to be more for partly the reason what rule's talking about which is actually you know the very presence of more female public historians raises different questions hopefully now the reason why i put this with caveats is because i do not like the idea of me saying that to someone them going out and seeing a lot worse abuse than what rule and i get Rule and I get abuse aimed at white European male. That's the abuse we get. There is nothing like the abuse I know female public historians get um, or uh, academics of colour, uh, you know, or any form of minority group at all. They get horrific abuse. So that was why I wanted in the talk to kind of highlight, you know, we have things in place to try and help people guide through that, but that is a reality. However, that's very negative. So on the flip side, absolutely, because you bring um, different groups of people, bring different questions, bring different interests, they bring different approaches to the same question. And that's particularly useful on Ask Historians with the different answers. Bad Ancient, I, I you know, I, we receive a question and I think, oh, we'd answer it in this way. I send it to um, an expert and they just, completely different direction and it's just really interesting and you get these amazing um an amazing tapestry of voices that show that history is not a single monolithic thing and that you know these all these interpretations are valid all these interpretations should be there to be read to be heard and to be um taken account of uh, rule anything to, to add there no i mean I, I completely subscribe to everything that owen has said i mean it's exactly that that conundrum that you keep running into that that on the one hand we want to encourage this we want to tell people we want to tell women we want to tell uh, uh non-binary people that join us come do this because that is how you create representation that is how you create a platform um but on the other hand uh, on the one hand it's putting further you know free labor on them which disproportionately hits them anyway um and secondly you're putting them in a place where they are suddenly in public where we know that people from such minorities receive disproportionate amounts of criticism so it's a very difficult thing to say and so i mean all of my perspective all my understanding on this comes entirely from my female colleagues moderating ask historians uh and be colleagues um who specifically um tell me this kind of thing the difficulty of being uh in a public space as a woman as an authority every single one of them has encountered you know abuse has encountered in you know comments discrediting them purely because of their gender um and it's very difficult to try and encourage people to to do it anyway so for us we have these periodic moments when um when we sort of deliberately bring out those who are comfortable announcing themselves as a woman online in order to show that those authorities exist those voices are part of the way we run things they are part of our uh of our our ecosystem 
um, in the hope that our readers will be encouraged to, to see us as an inclusive space and to believe that their voices will be heard. Thank you. Uh, I think we probably just have time for, for one more question. So I'm going to be slightly cheeky and combine two in here. So uh, first of all, uh, do either of you have any uh, good recommendations for reputable books or other public websites about everyday life in Sparta? And secondly, maybe just to end, have either of you considered writing a full length book aimed at myth busting in Sparta or, or in, anywhere else in the ancient world? Uh, okay, so the first one was uh, books and that on Spartan myth busting. Best for me at the moment that isn't high quality scholarship, which are very expensive. Um, let's be frank. Um, I really like is it Andrew Bayless uh, has just released um, the OUP book, tiny book. It's thirty five thousand words. Uh, it's a tiny little book, fits in your pocket. Um, and it is a brilliant overview, absolutely brilliant overview of the debates that are going on, brilliant overview of the kind of myth busting we want to see. Um, it doesn't give a narrative, um, anything like that. So it has to be something you're at least comfortable reading about Sparta. But, you know, being here, I presume you do. Um, that would be definitely my go to for that. Um, and it's like 10.99. It's, uh, it's just a steal. Um, and it is, it's a brilliant book. It's an absolutely brilliant book. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but I've just reviewed it for a, for a website, so I know it very well. Um, and it, it is a very good book. Um, the other one, uh, writing a book for, about it. Um, it's funny you should mention that. Because uh, yes, yes. <laughs> I have. Um, I have plans in the work. Anyone who reads much um, pop science, pop history and the like will no doubt I've noticed the Bad Ancient is a bit of a ripoff of Ben Goldacre's Bad Science, um, which is conceptually where we got the idea from. Um, and I've uh, definitely have plans to uh, publish it. It won't be out of Sparta particularly, um, but it will have an entire section on Sparta in the future. Yeah, no, no question about that. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Raul? Yeah, I mean, there are thankfully now some some quite accessible books that you can get, which which tell you the new Sparta century. So obviously the scholarship having changed so drastically over the last few decades. So there's Nigel Kennell's uh, Spartans and New History. And then there's uh, recently Andrew Bayliss's book. Um, so that's really great. I mean, that those those books are available and they're not very expensive. So thankfully, um, to some extent, that is that is that is out there. Um, and there are there are some additional works coming that, that take a more pop cultural approach to it. Um, as for the other question, I'm, I'm not writing that. I'm not an expert on Sparta. An expert on Sparta should write that. And I really do feel quite strongly about that because if I tried to do that, then not only would I be stealing their thunder unfairly, and, and honestly, there is, a, there is a market out there, please, please write this, um, it will be a hit. Uh, but also, um, there is a big risk of me, who's, who's just doing this as a side project essentially, um, making really quite significant mistakes if I try to do that, because it is not my field. And I feel like this is definitely a place where somebody needs to approach this with the full expertise of that, that that is something they've devoted their entire, you know, their career to understanding. Mm -hmm. So it should not be me. It should be it should be somebody who you've had on before, you know, somebody who can really uh, dig into the detail of it. Thank you very much, uh, Owen and Ruhl. Uh, today's Sparta Live webinar has given us uh, food for further thoughts, and we have to thank you for this. Um, unfortunately, the webinar is coming to an end, so I would like to uh, thank all of you who attended our webinar today. Um, a big thank you uh, goes to my co-host, uh, Mayor Dukas, uh, who from what I hear also has a book in press about ancient Sparta. I would also like to thank the city of Sparty, uh, my brilliant colleagues, George Woodhausen, Oliver Thomas and Hannah Regan in the Department of Classics and Archaeology, who amidst the very heavy teaching workload, offer their time and support to the cities. I would like to thank uh, our PhD student, Matt Thompson, for his continuing help with the series, uh, the marketing and events team in the School of Humanities, our IT officer, um, Teddy Wilmer, and of course, to all of you, our viewers who join us uh, from all around the, the globe. Uh, we hope to see you again next uh, for the next Sparta Live uh, webinar, which is going to take place in two weeks time, that is March the 8th, 
Uh, and this time we will be talking about medicine in ancient Sparta with uh, uh, the historian Dr. Yanis Chiloyanis, who just published his book uh, on the topic. Uh, I'm not sure if my co-host is back because he had to... Uh, yes, back. You are here. So um, before uh, we close the session, uh, I would say goodbye from me and uh, stay safe. Um, and uh, Petros will close the uh, the webinar with few uh, words. Uh, Petros, over to you. Um, uh, Chrysanthi, again, we're grateful for what you have been doing. Let me extend an invitation to visit us in Sparta post-COVID. Uh, we expect by this summer things should be much better. So, Royal and Owen uh, and Matt uh, and George, please uh, visit us uh, the soonest. If we can come up with any ideas about a nice uh, quasi-Netflix film on uh, some of the stories we discussed, uh, I will try to find some uh, producers because there could be a ready audience for that. Uh, you know, the brand name is half there anyhow. So there may be something I'll try to find. Give me some ideas and I'll try to find some people who can help us with the financing and the production. So many, many thanks. It has been excellent. Uh, we're grateful to the whole Nottingham uh, team and to yourselves for doing research that is uh, so close to our hearts. And uh, let's make our rendezvous for two in two weeks time. Hi to everybody from Sparta. Hi, hi.